Hello, everyone, and welcome to another very special edition of the Do Good to Lead Well podcast series. I'm your host, Craig Dowden, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you join us today. I'm really excited about sharing this episode with you. One of the many cool things that I get to experience when hosting this podcast is I have the chance to get pre-released copies of upcoming books. And today we're going to dive into an exceptional book that was just released on Tuesday, February 6th. And it's awesome. It's absolutely fantastic. One of the core elements of this podcast is how can we be at our best? And so I had the profound privilege to speak with both authors during a special taped episode earlier this year. Eric Potterat, PhD, is a clinical and performance psychologist and a leading expert in individual and organizational performance optimization. Eric retired as a commander from the U.S. Navy after 20 years of service, during which he helped create the mental toughness curriculum used during Navy SEALs training. He spent several years as the director of specialized performance for the Los Angeles Dodgers and has also worked with Red Bull athletes, the U.S. women's national soccer team, the Miami Heat, and numerous Olympic athletes, first responders, business leaders, and NASA astronauts. His co-author, Alan Eagle, is an author and executive communications consultant, helping leaders and companies shape and tell their stories. He spent 16 years at Google, partnering with executives to communicate the company's story to clients, partners, employees, and the public. He is the co-author of the books, How Google Works, and Trillion Dollar Coach. And I have to say, this conversation was truly jam-packed with incredible insights and actual nuggets. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I had recording it. So without further ado, going to dive right in to talk about their amazing book, Learned Excellence. I'd love to start with uh, the question at the beginning of every podcast. And, and again, congratulations on such an outstanding book. Uh, what inspired you both to write this book, Learned Excellence? Uh, well, I'll start, uh, Eric, if that's okay. Eric okay. came and gave a talk at Google. I was working at Google, and this was in um, May of uh, 2020 or 21. I, I don't even recall now, uh, but it was during COVID. And uh, I wasn't sure I was going to go sit in on this talk, but my wife encouraged me to. And I was just fascinated by Eric's approach, um, hands-on approach to developing these, uh, these mental disciplines for excellence. And I was fascinated by how all of my colleagues were really engaged with it as well. And I'd written a couple of previous books, How Google Works, about Google's management style, Trillion Dollar Coach, about executive coaching and leadership. And I thought, wow, this would be a, a cool one to follow up with, a book about performance. Yeah, for me, uh, obviously, I, I met Alan shortly after that talk, and he he uh, FedExed me a copy of Trillion Dollar Coach, which I consumed in a night. I really, really enjoyed the writing style. Um, so we put our heads together. And I guess, Craig, for me, you know, I spent 30 years as a clinical and performance psychologist and worked with about 25,000 really incredible performers. And I really have been wanting for years to eventually put together a book that that met a, th a few things that, that, that were hard lines for me. I wanted to make sure things were actionable and applicable. Uh, you know, one of my pet peeves is I didn't want to give, you know, contribute to more noise out there. I wanted it to be signal and people could actually do things with the things that they're learning. Um, and then secondly, and arguably more importantly, I really wanted to, to put across a narrative that I'm, frankly, I'm done with the narrative of I can never do what he or she is doing because they were born that way. Whether you're a CEO, C-suite you know, executive, whether you're an elite athlete, Navy SEAL, um, you know, we, we have fantastic interviews with 32 of the world's top performers, but there are thousands of others that we left off the list who have a very similar story. And everything that they have become is literally learned. There are some physical advantages, some intellectual advantages that people may or may not have. But, um, you know, people can be born with hardware uh, and not perform, 
Uh, and I think that, you know, there's a software piece here uh, that we really wanted to, or that I wanted to unpack. And, and Alan and I put our heads together and, and we did, I think, a, a reasonable job in doing that. So, Well, I couldn't agree more. It's an exceptional read. And there's so many great insights. And, and I love how you reference the research and the science, which to me is a passion of mine. And then most importantly, bringing those ideas into a very powerful, practical level so people can, after reading the book, go out and immediately put them into practice. And I'm going to build, Eric, on your great uh, reference to the hardware software, because it's one of the most powerful metaphors for me throughout the book. Is you can you unpack that idea a little bit more in terms of that hardware software and how it relates on our road to peak performance and reaching our potential? Yeah, you bet. And then I'll turn it over to Alan as well. I think for years I've I've worked in communities where the hardware has been incredible. And again, not only on the military side, but in professional sport, you think of you know the traditional human hardware is nutrition, is strength and conditioning. In business, at the C-suite level or executive level, it's tactics. Um, the, the problem is, problem with a small P, is that at the world-class level, everyone has similar hardware. Think of the Olympics, right? Olympic athletes show up, every country sends their best men and women to perform. And usually the difference between a medal and no medal is sometimes you know tens of thousands of a second, for example. So everyone shows up with incredibly powerful hardware, as it were. What I wanted to invite, the, what we wanted to invite the readers to think about is there's an entirely different way to approach this. Like what is above the neck and between the ears? And I like that computer metaphor. Software in the computer world or our smartphone world makes everything work. The, you know, the most updated operating system, the most updated app. So I think it, at some level, if we can get the, the listener to think about themselves as, hey, you may have very successful business tactics, you may be very successful as an athlete, a weekend warrior, whatever it may be, but at the end of the day, I can name, unfortunately, tens of dozens of people who have had incredible hardware who just don't perform because their software is not most you know up to date, as it were, so... And one of the things I also uh, want to explore with you both is that I love that you wrote a chapter about values and goals. Mm. And so, and you start basically right out of the gate with that. And it's such a powerful idea of where to begin when it comes to peak performance. So can you talk to us a little bit more about why you put values first in that chapter title and how values play such a vital role in terms of our uh, pursuit of excellence? I think if you, um, <clears throat> one of the main ways that people prevent themselves from achieving their best, people, people hold themselves back from learning excellence is they worry too much about reputation. And, you know, when we're born, we don't care about reputation. We're, you know, we're all about learning and ourselves and so on. But then, you know, pretty quickly we start to worry about it. And so, and then you hear a lot about, well, focus on your identity, focus on who you are, do things for yourself, not your reputation. Okay. That sounds great. How do I do that? Most times uh, people don't really take the time to really understand who they are. And uh, when we, you know, when Eric was giving that talk at Google and he talked about this identities credo, I thought, well, I know who I am. Here's who would, what would be in my credo. But then I started to think about it and it was like, well, I sort of know. Like, you know, I've kind of have to have this concept, but have I ever really written it down and really thought about it, really taken a disciplined approach to it? No. And, you know, I'm, I'm many decades on the planet and I still only sort of know my values and my credo. Uh, so just the exercise we walk through, such a simple exercise, write them down, share them with others, uh, and then codify that, I think becomes very powerful. Uh, so we don't just say, you know, it's, it's identity and values, not reputation. We then go to the next step and say, okay, and here's how to act on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, with respect to the tactics, I'll, I'll just shelve those for a moment and I'll come back. But I think at the 30,000 foot level, I, I, I think Alan hit the nail on the head. One of the things that I have seen, Craig, in again, 30 years, 25,000 touch points, is sometimes I felt like a kid in a candy store. Like I'm just a regular guy who, you know, got a degree, but I'm around incredible performers. And after a while, you start to see some themes right? Whether it's 600, 1,000, 10,000, whatever it is, however many people, you start to see some themes. And one of the chief themes that I saw that was the data that was, you know, coming off of the page, as it were, was that the best performers in the world 
seem to accelerate how quickly they're valuing identity over reputation. Mm -hmm. I think when you, when we talk about ages and stages in life, most of us, as we get older, as we stage, as we become wiser, whatever the term we want to use, um, I, I think most of us are going to make that change anyhow, where we start to care less about what other people think. Right. I mean, and you, you, you know, it when you hear it, right. People next to you will just say, I just don't care what people think anymore. So what I've noticed over the years is the best performers are just accelerating this. They're doing, they're moving to this level much faster. So it then made sense to st try to come up with tactics to get performers in general to think about how they can codify that movement or how they can develop a process to that movement. So in the book we talk about, and, and I try to limit it, but to, you know, 10 words, if, if you will, that, that really speak to your identity markers or your values credo. Um, and I often say that if this is done in 30 minutes, it's done poorly. It should be an iterative process. It should take a while and you may change some words a month or two down the line. But the last thing I'll say is if, and, or when this is done properly, relief happens because for the first time, then you're doubling down on what's important to you. By the way, your reputation will be fine, but if it's done properly, you should be vectoring every decision through that matrix or, you know, uh, maybe a glasses metaphor or a compass metaphor that becomes true north. Um, I think the old, the old me may have been a little bit concerned about reputation and making, you know, being seduced by the wrong things as it were based on reputational, uh, uh, I think dividends, if you will, but now if you do it right, it's just, everything should be filtered through identity. Well, and one of the things that I think is so powerful, and I'm, I'm so happy that we're diving into the values credo, is also the idea that this evolves over time. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's such a powerful reflection of our own self-growth and discovery. Yeah, I mean, I, look, unfortunately, we're all going to get older and we're all going <laughs> to age and stage. And as those experiences occur they almost chip away at a belief system, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have reading glasses that I try not to wear often unless I absolutely have to. But if I give Alan or you my reading glasses to try on, you'll put them on and you'll be like, oh my gosh, Eric, this your eyes are, you know, screwed up because that prescription is very unique to me. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, maybe the audience member can, can think about it this way. Every experience that we all have in life chisels away at our own belief system or our own lens, another metaphor I really like. So as we age and stage and we bring on more experiences, by definition, our prescription to how we're viewing life is changing. Therefore, our values and our identity markers can change as well. Some, I think, are going to are going to probably stand the test of time. They're, they're going to be hey, let, me, let me launch that a little bit, Eric, because I think... Um, once you're kind of into your twenties, a lot of those values and identity markers, I don't think they change that much. Like I'm just glancing at mine and I was in my twenties, 40 years ago. And those probably described me pretty well 40 years ago. Now, how I, how I manifested them mm -hmm. in my actions and my relationships might be very different. True. Um, yeah. And, but I, I think like the, the, a lot of the core identity doesn't change that much. How you, how you express it, how you invest your time in it. That's, those are the things that change. And you did also mention your beliefs, the belief system, which can sometimes uh, harm you uh, as, as we, we've seen with self-talk, something, you know, the ABC, something happens, your self-talk kicks in and it has a, you know, your, your, your negative belief system might kick in. But I sort of challenge you on the idea of, I get your identity markers will change some, but I don't know. How much do you think they really evolve? Let me give you a tangible example. And again, we don't need to thumb wrestle over this with my co-author, but <laughs> I can give you a tangible example. I highly doubt that age 20, one of your value markers was going to be parenthood or family as much as it is now, mm. or at least for me, like, again, I'll, I'll indict myself. So I mean, that's, you know, I think, and, and we can talk for days on this, but I do think there is room for movement in some sure. in how they're valuing yeah. certain things at ages and stages. So. Well, and what I love about the idea within the book, and so many of us were just out where it's activity, it's go, 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 go. And what I love that you challenge us to do as readers, and then also to take that away is to reflect on these critical questions. 
And sometimes we almost assume that we know what these things are. And I appreciate what both of your points are in terms of that freeing insight with when we spend more time with ourselves, when we reflect on these important questions, these navigational questions, if you will, now what it does is provide us with much more insight in terms of, so who are we and how do we want to behave in a particular situation? And so I think that's so, so important and so, so powerful. Uh, and and I love the, the story within the book as well. Uh, you have that great work with uh, the Red Bull diver, cliff diver. <laughs> I think that's such a powerful insight. Can both of you share that that experience and how those values came to play in terms of that uh, in terms of that uh, example? Yeah, you're referring to David Colturi, who's a Red Bull cliff diver, who was uh, one of Eric's clients. And uh, they regularly stand on the top of a bridge or a cliff uh, 90 to 100 feet off the water and dive in. And he, he talked about how uh, his reputation would, you know, he'd start to get a little negative self-talk going. His reputation worries would kick in as he was standing up there. And then uh, David suffered an accident on a dive and spent some time in a hospital and was out of the game for a while and had to really consider whether he was going to continue diving or not. And it was during that time, he really worked on this values credo. And when he came back, he was much more quiet on top of the podium, on top of the pedestal when he was about to dive, because he was much more focused on who he was. He knew why he was doing it and was able to quiet that self-talk and that worry about reputation and, you know, actually improved quite a bit as a result. Yeah, I think in the book, Craig, there, there are numerous examples, obviously Nathan Chen. I mean, we, we have, you know, wakeboarders, we have... Uh, Toby Miller, we have a, a, a champion uh, snowboarder as well. I mean, there's numerous occasions where, for lack of a better term, developing the values credo forces them almost to have the sense of freedom, almost like this, something's lifted off their shoulders and they can really focus on back to what's you know at the core of, of why they like their discipline, whatever that is. And we're focusing a lot so far on, on athletes, but I mean, the, the I think... Um, the, the applications to business. We unpack a lot of C-suite individuals as well, CIA, Navy SEALs, you know, non-athletes as well. I think it is freeing to really focus on those those values, you know, identity versus reputation for sure. Well, and it's one of the great ideas within the book. And, and you talk about that in terms of no matter where you are, no matter what role you have, no matter what position, these are all fantastic skills, insights that we can apply in our personal and professional lives. There aren't a particular domain, even though, again, as you've talked about, you've both spent your careers in terms of really understanding and, and analyzing success at the highest levels, at the peak performance levels. And yet every single person can benefit from this. And as part of that chapter, I love that it was values and goals. And one mm. of the things I loved, I sense that it was intentional, that values came first and then goals second. And I thought that was such a, a powerful insight that that you that you planted in, in the book. Let's talk about goals, because here we are. <laughs> it's early in the new year. Uh, people set resolutions. They're looking to achieve things that are important to them. I love how you unpack uh, goal setting, and also you provide a roadmap for our success. So can you talk about how we can go about effectively setting goals? Yeah, I think when you when you look at the world's best performers, again, no one's born with this. They're they're setting and achieving goals markedly differently. So, you know, Alan and I in the book unpack that. One of the, you know, fun facts, multiple fun facts about goal setting. But one of the things that we noticed is that if people ideate a goal, if they just come up with a goal that they decide to set for what you just said, obviously new year, probably most goals are going to be around fitness or nutrition. We know where those gym memberships are going to be six weeks from now. Unfortunately, I hope I'm wrong, but generally speaking, they're going to be back to where they were. Um, and if people just ideate a goal, they come up with a goal, you're about 43% likely to achieve that goal. If you put a goal on paper, or on a computer in a spreadsheet somewhere, you're writing down a goal, that statistic goes up to about 62%. The cool one, in my opinion, is the next level, when you verbally share a goal. So not only are you thinking about a goal, you're writing it down, but then you, you share it with, let's call it an accountability partner, a coach, a teammate, a friend, a neighbor, a spouse, a loved one, significant other, it doesn't matter. The statistic goes up to about 76%. 
So the takeaway message here is not only think about a goal, write it down and verbally share it. Moreover, what we see is the Goal achievers are actually setting non-fuzzy goals. Mm. They're setting more tangible goals. So I, an example of a fuzzy goal is I want to be the best. I have no idea what the hell that means, to be honest. I think I do, but I maybe not. Um, I want to be better is less fuzzy, but still is not very specific. So we can measure a baseline and then we can challenge that person later and measure a change, a delta. But what we want people to understand is to set very specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely goals. For example, I want to run a 5K in this amount of time by this date in the calendar. Mm -hmm. Lastly, when you look at the best performers in the world, they're not focusing on outcome goals. Now, I'm, I'm naive, or I'm not that naive, I guess. We all work for someone, whether it's in a business and the business has outcome-driven goals that have to be met for stakeholders, shareholders, et cetera. Or in sport, for example, obviously you need to win. You need to win games. You need to win medals, whatever it may be. But when you unpack what these top 25,000 people are doing, they're focusing on a recipe that's repeatable and consistent. And we call those process goals. So I'm going to do X, Y, and Z four times a day. And over time, if they stay true to process goals, the outcome gets delivered more times than not. One of my favorite quotes around this is, amateurs focus on outcome, professionals focus on process. Mm -hmm. When we're all young and new at whatever our discipline is, outcome, outcome, outcome. I want the trophy, I need the title, I need whatever. But as we professionalize, we, come, we become wiser and we understand as long as I develop a consistent recipe, I'm going to get, and that process is stayed true, I'm going to, those outcomes are going to be delivered more times than not. And I would just add, uh, goal setting is a critical part of business culture. At Google, we use a goal process called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results, and it really became a, a core part of the culture and um, worked very effectively. So I think goal setting, look, all businesses set quarterly goals and you have business plans and so on, um, but making them smart goals. And then we, in the book, we talk about having a one month, a three month and a six month goal and have it across the multiple aspects of your life, not just your career and job, but your, your friends and family, your hobbies, your health, uh, the different aspects of your life where you want to be excellent. Set goals in all of them. Mm. Well, and, and I love that, and particularly the, the emphasis around, you know, the science of goal setting, if you will, and how, and how depending on the, the strategies we use, the impact that, that you have. And I also really appreciate about the specificity of the goals, the more specific, the more likely we are to achieve it in the process side. And I love the point that you were just making, Alan, and, and I know you talk about that as well in the book, is that we're so much more than our job or whatever quote unquote, our job, and you talk about the different pillars of our lives. So can, can you unpack that idea for us? Because I think that's so powerful. You just had talked about, Alan, you know, let's not limit it to one area. There's so many more. Can you share about that almost richness or fullness of the, the goal setting universe? Yeah, Eric loves to use the, um, the metaphor of a house on stilts or, or pillars. And if a house is built on one or two stilts or pillars, well, that's not a really stable house, is it? You know, the next wave, the next big wind is going to knock it over. And all of our lives, most people's lives are built on multiple pillars. You've got your, you know, your most important ones for most people are going to be their jobs and their family, particularly if they're in the stage where they're raising kids. But you've got friends, you've got community, you've got health, you've got hobby, you've got spirituality. Uh, and ultimately that adds up to your legacy. These are all really important pillars. And um, you want to have goals and pay attention to nurture each of those pillars. Because that way, look, let's, uh, you know, I've been now uh, laid off and, or, or fired from four different jobs in my career. Four times. Mm -hmm. That's quite a blow. If I didn't have other things to fall back on, or not even fall back on other things, other pillars in life, that would be devastating. But because you've got your family, your friends, other things, it's not as devastating. And so the same goes to goals and, and time management. Set them across various pillars or aspects of your life. Uh, and it gets back to sort of the, 
uh, the, the worrying less that Eric uh, talked about identity. Look, you want to perform at your very best, but you also know that if you don't and you've got multiple aspects to your life, you're going to be okay. The other thing I'll add, Craig, is that there, there's been a lot of work around balance. And as Alan said, I really do like this, this beach house metaphor because I think people can relate. You know, the waves of adversity are going to a come. Beach house, Eric. That's even better. I like, <laughs> I like a beach house, right? With waves of adversity, right? They're coming. But it's interesting because as you challenge people, and by the way, the best performers in the world are doing this. This isn't new. It's new to a lot of us maybe who aren't the best at what we do. We look at these individuals and believe it or not, they're feeding and watering multiple pillars of their lives. And, and again, I don't want to name any particular people, but we could probably name a few dozen business executive, military members, and or athletes who have become what they do. They fed and water so much of the work pillar at the expense of others that by the time they transition, call it retirement, call it whatever you want, they run into a brick wall. And it's because, again, it's been, it's been reinforced on merely one pillar. The other thing I'll say for the audience as well is don't believe the narrative that well-balanced or well-fed and watered pillars aren't good performers noise, run away from that narrative. In fact, all the meta-analyses, all the research are very clear. The more balanced performers are, the healthier they are, the longer they live, the more innovative they are. And here's the key one. Oh, by the way, they're more productive at their discipline, which is ironic, right? So. <laughs> well, I love that. And as a Canadian in winter, having the metaphor of a beach house is awesome. So I'll happily <laughs> follow that one. And, uh, and, and I love the points that you both are making because, and, and Alan, you talked about job loss. And one of the reasons why it's so profoundly impactful is that people often their identity, and I love, we've touched on this, their identity is their job. And as you so rightly and powerfully point out, we're so much more. And I love uh, Eric, how you're talking about that and then thinking about, okay, so that broadening perspective. And I love, once again, as a, as, as, as a passionate data enthusiast, it's the evidence. Like, let's look at the research. And when we are, when we have a more balanced perspective, when we're enriched, well, guess what? Our performance elevates. We're much more engaged. And so we're at our best. It doesn't take away from our peak performance, our ability to achieve our potential. It nourishes it. Um, another awesome idea that's in the book that I think is so fascinating when you read the title of Learned Excellence and then there's a chapter around failure. I love that you guys tackle this because it's brilliant. It's so, so good. Can you talk about the importance of failure on our road to personal and professional excellence? Yeah, we, um, we include that in our chapter on mindset. And Eric and I talked a lot about mindset and there's many different books about mindset and articles. It's become a, a popular term in the last 20, 25 years. And we were thinking about, okay, but how do you practice mindset? There, there's a couple of important uh, insights, I think, in that chapter. One is different mindsets for different roles. And I will let Eric talk about that. And then the point you bring up is how do you practice mindset? Well, you practice mindset through the things you can control your attitude, your effort, and your behavior. Mm -hmm. So any mindset you want to adopt, you need to think about one, what sort of attitude does that mean I should take? What sort of effort does that mean I should invest? What sort of behavior, what sort of things should I do? If I want to be an XYZ mindset, here's what my attitude, my effort, and my behavior needs to be. But of course, it's really easy to be, I don't know, gritty or you know, a growth mindset or what have you when everything's going great. Mm -hmm. uh, when, what, you know, when you really get to practice a mindset is when you fail. So our point is to, you know, don't go and seek failure, but don't run away from it. Mm. Say yes to things, take risks. I had an old boss at Google talked about move into white spaces, take on these things where you might fail and start doing this at a young age. And then when you fail, which you will think about, okay, what's my attitude going to be? What's my effort going to be? And what's my behavior going to be? And now I am practicing this mindset. Craig, I would invite your listeners and yourself to, to do an honest appraisal and an honest kind of uh, thinking exercise with themselves that I almost guarantee that most of the 
the most significant learnings for your audience members are at, at occurred during times of failure or shortly thereafter mm -hmm. and really unpacking that. So look, I, I don't want this giant cane to come out and kind of pull me off of this podcast. Like how dare he talk about <laughs> failure? But I actually do think we're at a crossroads in the United States and Canada, probably worldwide. There's an entire generation. I'm not being political here. I'm just being factual of individuals that are risk averse because as you've already alluded to people are so worried about reputation they're so worried about you know not taking a risk because they don't want to fail again as alan i think eloquently stated no none of us want anyone to fail but it's the only way you're going to iterate and innovate and the world let's face it is getting much more difficult and the challenges that we're going to face politically climate wise food. It's, I mean, we could go down many rabbit holes here. We're going to need people that are willing to try things outside of their comfort zone. Where I believe people make mistakes, now to come back to the book, is people try too much too soon, too fast. Mm. And I think that, you know, we all kind of live in our comfort bubble, if you will. And what I challenge people to do, what we challenge people to do is incrementally move out of your comfort zone in multiple areas within your relationships, physically, within work, within your leadership, within relationships, within your hobbies, as you're incrementally, it's almost like compound interest. You're not going to notice it in a week or a month, but over time, you've really started to navigate with failing forward because you're trying something at a very low cost, but you're iterating and learning as a result. I love the quote, uh, you know, I either win or I learn. There's no failure, right? I mean, I, I love that. So, yeah. Yeah, look at it. Look at how, uh, you know, take something simple like, uh, I don't know, trying a new restaurant or trying a new type of food. And you might like, okay, I'm going to go try something new. And you go ahead and you do it. And then, uh, I don't know, the service was bad. You hated the food. What do you, you know, a lot of times your attitude is going to be, well, that was dumb. I'm going back to, you know, I, I'm going back to what I did before. I'm not going to do that again. Wow, why did I do that? I'm kicking myself. I wasted the money, you know. That is a lot of time how you might react to it, but that's probably not the mindset you want to practice. Mm. So that's when you check, you stop yourself and you go, wait a second, here's a chance to practice my attitude, my effort and my behavior. Uh, by so, the way, by the way, Kyle, we, is, yeah. is a great way to get into practice. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. I was going to say, we, we interviewed 32 of, of, you know, we could have done thousands, but we interviewed 32 of, you know, incredible performers, Cirque du Soleil, CIA, SEALs, athletes, business executives, coaches, and to a person, I mean, literally, we don't have time in the book. We, we would run out of pages to a person. When you interview these, I think most people would agree, these are the best people at their craft. All of them have many, many stories of ridiculous failures. And they, again, they, they don't stop. They don't decide to change how they're navigating or, oh, hey, maybe I won't become a professional X, Y, Z, or maybe I won't become a CFO or a CEO. They use that to kind of build momentum and fail forward. Every mm -hmm. single one of these interviews, we could have unpacked numerous failure stories as well. So uh, my favorite was uh, Carly Lloyd, who's maybe the best female soccer player ever and missed a penalty kick in the 2011 World Cup final. You know, you don't get a higher profile failure than that. And they lost the game. And she talked about how she was really devastated down for weeks after that. But then she picked herself up. She reflected on her attitude. Her attitude became, I am never missing another penalty kick in a World Cup tournament, period. Now, that's an attitude. Effort, okay, of course, she practiced like crazy. And behavior, she looked at her process. How did she approach that kick? How did she decide if she was going to kick upper left side of the goal or upper right side. And she uh, adjusted her process. Mm -hmm. So she used that failure as an opportunity to get better. Well, and one of the things, and thank you both for this, uh, it is a masterclass in terms of how we approach life and particularly the setbacks. And one of the things I love about the book is that it really, it takes ideas that are out there if you will, and then really frames them in this powerful, insightful way that extends that idea in terms of its practice. And particularly around the discussion we're having about failure, because I couldn't agree more. And it reminds me of the acronym for fail from action I learn or first attempt in learning. I love how you frame it in that way. And in particular, you talked about the importance of 
practicing our mindset. I think that's such a powerful piece and it comes throughout. You close the book around the importance of practicing excellence and that's something you continue to 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 challenge us to do throughout. And Alan, I believe you had mentioned because I'd love to unpack this or explore this a little more deeply. You talk about choosing your mindset. And I think for many, when you read that, it's like, whoa, I'm choosing my mindset. Both of you are experts on this. Can you talk about that statement, the power of that statement, and what it means to us as we approach our own pursuit of excellence? Yeah, a couple things on that. Um, one of the revelations to me in this book is that, wait a minute, I've never chosen my mindset. I've sort of, I, here's my mindset. This is what I grew up with. It probably, who knows where it came from, but that's who I am. It doesn't have to be that way at all. You can't choose your mindset. And then the important revelation, and I'll let Eric talk about this a little more, is that your mindset's going to be different for different roles. So your mindset at work is going to be very different from your mindset uh, with your spouse or your mindset with your kids or with your parents. That might be different from your mindset with your friends. Each one of those you can choose. Uh, and the, it starts with the act of choosing, and then you need to identify and define that mindset a little bit more, which is where transition comes in. I'll let Eric talk a little more about that. Yeah, I think, Craig, that uh, again, back to this narrative, no one's born this way. Literally, no one's born with a mindset. That is, clearly, mindset is learned. I think the, the most uh, obvious example that probably most of the listeners would know is the Kobe Bryant Mamba mentality. Like people have heard the Mamba mentality. That was a persona and a mindset that he chose to develop, you know, on the basketball court. When we ask within the book, we ask the reader, and I'll ask your the executives who are listening to the podcast as well, think about the top four or five roles that you play. For me, you know, I'm a performance psychologist, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a pickleball player, and I'm a grumpy neighbor. Those are kind of my four, you know, four or five <laughs> core core roles. The the evidence is really clear that when you look at the world's best kind of performers in any discipline, they're not having the exact same mindset for every role. Think of I again, I'll, I'll think of uh, an occupation that maybe the mindset for success would require you to be relentless, gritty hyper-focused but and competitive. That mindset will not work in a relationship, right? Good luck being competitive with your significant other um, or as a parent, right? So I think it's, it's a really important, I like the metaphor a lot of a dimmer switch mm -hmm. when you talk about, you know, changing routines, if you will, or, you know, pre and post performance routines. I think the dimmer switch can also be applied to a mindset as I am white hot with certain attributes that I think I need to have as a performance psychologist. I'm going to dim those down and dim up the ones as I then am interacting with my spouse or my children. So we have a, the story in the book of one of Eric's clients who was the chief marketing officer at a major brand. And so all day, every day, her work is about brand. Well, how do you project yourself? What are your brand values? You know, how are you perceived? And then of course she went home and it didn't really work that well. And uh, she went out and played golf with her friends and it was all about, well, what are you wearing? And how does your swing look? And they're like, dude, we just want to have some fun. And uh, you know, it was really harming different aspects of her life. Mm -hmm. And so Eric came up with a very simple dimmer switch routine of when you're on your way home, repeat this mantra. What do you want to be as a parent and as a partner? Mm -hmm. What are the three words that define you as a parent? I'm patient. I'm a, I'm a coach. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know what they are. And those are very different than as a, as a C-suite leader at work. It's that simple, three to five words, but then repeat them to yourself. And that's how you can, that, that, that act uh, that trains your mind, that triggers your mind, oh, time for the new mindset. Mm. Well, and and again, what I really appreciate that the idea of the dimmer switch, again, there's so many great metaphors throughout the book and ways in which to think about it. And Alan really appreciated your observation around, well, just kind of, well, my mindset just kind of shows up and <laughs> and hadn't really thought about it before. And I think once again, and as I was reading, I was going, this is so great because what it's doing is taking things that we may have a little bit of conscious awareness of and going, no, wait a second, 
bring more attention to that, bring more focus, slow down and figure out these things, spend some time. And I love that, Eric, with the dimmer switch around, okay, what aspects of myself do I turn up, turn down in these situations? It's all around choice. It's all around empowerment. It's all around getting to know ourselves. And I'd love for both of you to talk a little bit about the mental toughness side, because I know mm -hmm. that's a key, key piece and we're facing lots of challenges so what does mental toughness mean to you? And what are some of the key techniques that we can use so that we can stay maximally resilient as we're navigating the different challenges and opportunities in our personal and professional lives? Yeah, maybe I'll take this one first. So I would invite your listeners to think about how they would define mental toughness to a fifth grader. That's kind of my my metric or my litmus. And, you know, pause for a moment and think about that. For me, I've heard, you know, probably tens of dozens of of different definitions. The one that hits home the most, I think, is the most simplistic. It is the ability to control the human stress response. I think when we think about people who don't or aren't perceive, perceived rather as mentally tough, whether they choke under pressure, they shake if they're speaking or whatever it may be, they're the opposite of that, right? They're they're mentally untough or maybe they're choking under pressure. So one of the things that we have an entire chapter around, what are the top you know, thousands of performers doing? They're really navigating about 10 different disciplines or 10 different practices around this. And I'll just kind of rifle through them. Pre and post, uh, pre and post uh, performance routines. So what routine do they um, exercise in order to get a certain mindset, for example, for a popular one is music maybe I, I work out yoga and then how do they dim down? So a post-performance routine. Another one is goal setting and segmenting. So they break larger goals into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. A third tactic is visualization. Uh, they visualize themselves in situations. They practice stress inoculation, as many senses as possible. They're more likely to not have a, and um, the human stress response, uh, uh, I guess, start if they, you know, if they visualized how they, you know, might have certain actions or, or um, processes during that action. And we call that one, Eric, just to interrupt you for a sec. We call it visualization, but you mentioned there in passing as many senses as possible. And one thing you said to me, and I think we put it in the book was that when you visualize something and, and again, you're not just seeing it, but you're, you know, you're feeling it, uh, you're hearing it, you're smelling it, all senses it's really kind of like you're practicing it. Yeah. And so when you've practiced something 10 or 15 or 20 times, you're just not going to be as stressed about it. And so, you know, we talk to people who they'll go look at the arena where they're going to be performing. They'll go and look pictures of it online and visualize themselves in the arena, like taking to that step. Uh, so visualization. Yeah. Yeah. Visualize. No, all five senses and do it over and over again. And it totally makes sense. It's like now you've done it 10 or 15 times. Sorry. There's a, going. there's a, there's a great quote that if your brain is firing, your brain is wiring and it makes sense. I mean, you can literally ask, I mean, if we had time to take every one of your listeners, sit them down and attach little electrodes to their legs and ask them to visualize running or skiing, there's going to be micro firing of their leg muscles. Again, software is making hardware work. So, you know, the, the practice of visualization is literally changing the neural networks as well. Another tactic and technique that we unpack is positive self-talk and thought management. The, the best performers in the world are, are focusing on their belief systems and they're looking for evidence differently than say non-elite performers who kind of get caught up in the activating event and woulda, coulda, shoulda. Uh, contingency planning, compartmentalization, uh, self-awareness and then unpacking, you know, with a team around you, when you do maybe fail or maybe, you know, have a failure, how can you unpack that after the mission? So these are just some of the tactics around mental toughness that we unpack. And again, all of these are things you can practice. So the, the advantage that performers have, if they're, you know, stage performers or athletes is, you know, they get to perform every, every night or every, every other day. There's a lot of games. There's always another game. Um, but in our regular jobs, you know, we may only get that job interview once or twice or that important sales meeting. So take, um, you can practice a lot of these 
just for example, deep breathing, you can just take time in your schedule and just breathe deeply, but also even look at little opportunities, little performances as opportunities to practice adversity tolerance. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you an example. I was giving a, a, a job review to someone on my team a couple of years ago and it didn't go well. This person didn't like their job review. And before I knew it, I was sweating. I was breathing hard. My vision was kind of uh, getting tunnel vision. And, um, and I, I was, it was later that I was like, oh, wait a minute, that was a stress response because I hadn't practiced it. I hadn't anticipated it. I hadn't done any contingency planning. I didn't do any breathing beforehand. So there are many opportunities. Uh, and our advice in the book is take these opportunities to practice this so that when you do get in a situation you know, that you can't prepare for, you still know what to do. You know to breathe. You know to stop the negative self-talk and so on. Well, and for anyone who was wondering, gee, I wonder if I should pick up a copy. Just think of, <laughs> that's just awesome. We've gone through incredibly powerful practices just in one small section of the book. And again, it's one of the reasons that I that I love it. Uh, perhaps the final question is around, and there's so many great quotes in the book as well. You talk about the idea that you can have it all, but not all at once. And I think sometimes we just push so hard to do that. Can you discuss that idea? Because that, to me, again, another mic drop moment. You want to take that one, Alan, first? Or yeah, wanna... well, we, we talked a little earlier about balance across the multiple pillars in your life, across uh, uh, work and relationships and hobbies and, and so on. And um, we talk in the book about uh, we one of Eric's clients was Dina Ryerson, who's a, an associate um, Uh, attorney general in the state of Oregon. I'm I'm not sure if associate is the right title, but she's an attorney general and just talked about how there were points when she just in her life, she just had to let the ball drop. She was working on a case and it was two weeks of heads down work. She had two children she was raising uh, and she's going to try to make time to work out during that time. Like, no, forget it. (laughs) You just, and our point is, of course, there's times when you need to let the balls drop and you just need to be overbalanced on one or two pillars. That's all you can do at the time. But our ask of people is be aware of that mm-hmm. and, and make a note of it somewhere in the distance. I'm going to go, this case is going to be over. I'm going to be on vacation. And then at that point, uh, you know, maybe top up the other area. So you, it's fine to be out of balance. We all have to be out of balance and in, in given times, but don't let that be a permanent situation. I like this term ages and stages. And I think the easiest one for most of us to really embrace and, and kind of have that aha is those of us or those individuals, listeners, maybe with young children, you know, there are going to be soccer games, ballets, plays, all of these things. And you kind of need to capitalize on some, and I'm not saying you divorce yourself of work and all those responsibilities, but there's going to be a time when you're going to have to overload some of those things. And those are passing things, man. They're, they're going to go away. And you can catch up on that. So just be aware of ages and stages. And, you know, you're going to have to strike while the iron's hot and your 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 ability to do certain things at certain times is okay. Uh, and don't get, you know, that self-deprecation. Don't get down on yourself just because you can't be everything to all. So, yeah. And thank you for that idea because I really appreciate, once again, the thoughtfulness behind it, the choice mechanism behind it, whereby, hey, certain things are coming up in my life right now, personally, professionally, and now I may be unbalanced in certain domains. And then also accepting that. And I also love how you both reinforce that idea to us that that's okay, that's life. And also, Alan, you pointed out, this is not a permanent solution either. It's recognizing, okay, continuing to pay attention. And Eric, you talked about, and then recalibrating at different times. All of these things, which again, it just comes out time and time again throughout the book of how important it is for me to be a thoughtful navigator of my life. If I'm truly pursuing excellence, excellence is a choice, it's a practice, and I want to be thoughtfully engaged in that entire process. So this has just been absolutely awesome. I've covered so much. And as you've both said at different times, we've only scratched the surface. Any key ideas or any final thoughts you want to leave the listeners with before we close uh, this episode today? Uh, I'll challenge the listeners to, you know, work outside of that comfort zone. We all have them. And it sounds a bit cliche, but just incrementally, don't try too much too soon. 
run fast and far from the narrative of I can never do what he or she is doing. It's complete nonsense. And if you don't believe us, you know, read the book and you're going to hear it from some of the world's best performers that they've all learned these things. So I hope, I hope it, we hope it hits a chord with, with the listeners and the readers for sure. So. Yeah. Just to say, um, this is not that much extra work to adopt some of these things. And in fact, in most cases, it will save you time and energy and make you better. Excellent. Well, thank you so, so much. Again, the book is Learned Excellence by Eric Potterat and Alan Eagle. The website is learnedexcellence.com. An awesome, awesome read. I have a privilege of, of reading lots of books. This is truly a masterclass at how we can be at our best. So congratulations to you both on the release of an outstanding book. And uh, I know everybody listening today is going to get a lot out of it. So thanks so much. And until next time, take care. Thank you, Craig. Take care. Cheers. Yeah.